I put a lot of work into this table. I mean, really, um, quite a lot of time in just thinking about how to organize it. And um, I'm not very happy with the result. I think it failed. On the other hand, I think most other tables are maybe worse. Have you heard of the Misi principle? So if ever, God forgive, forbid, you become consultants at McKinsey, I, I gather that is one of the main principles that they have, that when you make lists, they have to be Misi. Uh, and if your list is not Missy, you're kind of nobody, and everybody will criticize you. And uh, although I'm skeptical of McKinsey, as you can hear, uh, I think it, this is a good principle. A list should be mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive. So if you have five things in a list, they should be, they should exhaust the subject. Uh, and there should sort of, you know, there should, there should be some kind of logical... Because if you have a list that sort of, uh, you know, some of the things... Some of the things overlap and some things that you want to describe are not covered at all, uh, then it's not messy, right? <laughs> They're not mutually exclusive because some, some things could be in several categories. And some things are not covered by any category, and that's kind of useless description of, of, of this box, right? There is really one, one very nice example uh, of a good table, is this one. Right? You, you cannot move one thing and kind of say, ah, well, I have my own, you know, Swedish chemists have their own, we, we, we put this over here, you know, you can't do that. It took a number of decades, there were some attempts earlier to organize, you know, this, and gradually uh, there's agreement, uh, and this is very clear, there's very clear rules for where you put elements, so, you know, nowadays they make new elements, and it's also, again, it's very clear where you put them. Um, and then you kind of spend your time comparing with the one above and see if they're similar and so on. Because the chemical properties are very much decided by, very much this, a simple way of describing this is how many electrons there are in the, in the outer, sort of outermost layer. And this decides the, the properties of how, how elements react with each other. So it's, that's a really nice list. And, um, Compared to that list, this is a miserable failure, right? Mm -hmm. But um, uh, it's not like there's any other, anybody, any other environmental economist has made a better list. Very often you see really stupid lists of instruments. And it's hard, so first of all, there's no, there's no rows. The rows mean nothing here in this list, unfortunately. And even the columns are not very good. Uh, it's hard to describe, but people sometimes say, oh, there are economic instruments and then there are regulatory instruments, for instance. I didn't want to use the word economic instruments. Why not? Anybody have any ideas? Yeah, kind of. Um, so, Marty Weitzman, a very famous economist, one of the few people I know who might get the Nobel Prize one day, he wrote a, an article in 1974 that people are still kind of doing remakes of this article called P versus Q, which is about when you use kind of quantity-based instruments, he called the article P versus Q, or prices versus quantities. And uh, Q is when you regulate the quantity. We know what quantity is, uh, tons and grams and meters and that kind of stuff. That's quantity, right? So 
That's when you regulate um, quantities. And this column is when you regulate somehow when your instrument changes the price directly. So I've kind of used those two categories here as my number one and three. Um, here you are affecting the quantity directly. Here you are affecting the price. Now, um, the whole point of Marty's article, which we'll talk about later in the course, is that sometimes an economist recommend the price type instrument, sometimes the quantity type. In his case, it depends on on things to do with um, with risk. So there is uh, uncertainty about the uh, the cost and the uh, abatement benefits, and and if there's uncertainty, then sometimes, depending on a number of interesting conditions, sometimes it's better to choose a regulation. Sometimes it's better to use, say, a tax. Well, if, an, if a famous economist says that a regulation is the best instrument, then that becomes an economic instrument in certain circumstances. That's, there's, you know, there's an economics paper by a good economist that says that's a, a really good instrument. That, that must qualify as an economic instrument. And then well, there's people like saying, oh, there's legal instruments. And there again, you think about MISI. Well, what's the opposite of legal instruments? What are the other ones? Illegal ones? Yeah, well, you know, like, that's not very clever either. Um, and, and people who actually work with taxes, they could tell you you need to hire a lot of lawyers before you get a, like a gasoline tax through Parliament. Uh, if I write a gasoline tax, it would never have a chance to go through uh, Parliament. You know, it has to be a lawyer who writes it. Uh, and um, so, it's a very legal instrument. And it wouldn't be good if it was illegal. Right? Regulation. Sometimes regulation is called command and control. And you see this little abbreviation, like command and control. That makes you think of Stalin or someone like that. Uh, or Putin, maybe today, you know, you, your instrument is basically a speech by the president. That's the instrument, and he decides something. And um, so, it's sort of the word is, is such that we are automatically, we think, oh, regulation must be bad. And economic instruments must be good. But that's really superficial. Uh, most environmental legislation is actually quantities. This is a, a very large area. If you go to a real environmental ministry or the EPA in some country, that's what they do. They set regulations for the maximum amount of, of some chemicals in, in the air or in the water or and drinking water and that. that's the kind of thing they do. And uh, Weizmann says that some, sometimes that's the right thing to do. So, <coughs> so um, yeah, so it's not easy to come up with really good categories of instruments here. Having made that rather long and elaborate excuse, <laughs> I'll, I'll go through this. So this first list here, first column, are things where you affect the price directly. And the archetype here is the tax. You know what the difference between a tax and a, a charge, a fee, or a tariff are? The money in a tax goes where? Fiscal. Yeah, into the... Mr. Borg is the guy in Sweden. <laughs> Anders Borg, the finance minister's wallet, right? Or the public purse. 
goes straight into the treasury. Whereas a fee could be levied by the municipality of Gothenburg or by a national park or by a minister or something else. It could be a fee for, for handing in your uh, tax returns too late or for entering in a national park at night or whatever. There could be a fee and the money it does not go to the treasury, it's managed locally. There could be a charge for um, shooting a certain category of animal, whatever. It could be tariffs for water abstraction from a reservoir or something. Um, and of course a, a negative fee or tax is, is sort of like a subsidy. And subsidies are so common as instruments, sometimes as perverse instruments. We think, oh, subsidy, that'd be, that's a nice instrument. You, know, you could have subsidy for good things. If you go out and look, in reality, you usually find, you find the subsidies on the wrong things. Lots of bad things are subsidies, like coal. And so uh, a very common <coughs> instrument but it's kind of a perverse instrument. It's like scratching your left ear with your right hand kind of thing. It uh, is a subsidy reduction. The OECD writes books about subsidy reduction as like, a, like it's an instrument. But it's really getting rid of a perverse instrument. Uh, and so there are big programs to try to get rid of subsidy reduction, I mean to get rid of subsidies, uh, for instance, for fossil fuels or for overfishing. Those are two favorite areas where they kind of have subsidies for the wrong thing. Now sometimes you have a factory and you've got a big pipe coming out or a smokestack and you know, you know the pollution. Sometimes you don't know the... Um, it's hard to see the pollution. Take the case of mercury. Do people still have mercury thermometers in, in, in some countries? In Zambia, do you still have mercury thermometers? Hmm? You, your granny, maybe. <laughs> Old people still maybe have them. In Sweden, they, they were decided, they were declared illegal. Sweden has kind of tried to ban mercury. It's difficult because it's an element, but, uh, but you know, so basically, the, the, mer the mercury thermometers were the ones with this sort of like silvery blob at the end. And um, all Swedes had to hand in their mercury thermometers some, when was this, 15 years ago or something. And then they gave you a, a new electronic one in return. Kind of. Anyway, um, before that, do you know what happened? to a mercury thermometer, how, how mercury thermometers ended their lives. It's always the same way. Someone would have a really bad fever and they would go to the, you know, to the bathroom and then they would clean the, the mercury thermometer and then try to, you know, you know uh, shake it down. You had to shake them down. And then they would drop them and the mercury would come out on the floor. And since they were had a fever and felt tired, they would just throw the stuff down the toilet. So that's what happened. And it's just like one gram in the toilet. But it actually has an enormous effect. It can kind of, it can ruin a, a, a waste tra treatment plant for a city like Gothenburg for, for hours or days. It kills off the bacteria in, the, in the, there, it seems. So, I say all that because sometimes just one gram, well you could take a battery as well. Someone throws a battery in the woods. How are you going to tax that? I mean, you, we would like to, you know, the damage that one gram of mercury or cadmium or something can do is enormous. We would like to put a really big tax on this. Maybe, you know. 100,000 kroner per kilo or something. 
But how are you going to find the people who, who do the emissions? Because it's such a small emission. It's almost impossible, but there is a way. I, I'm, I'm going to try to sort of sell you something very simple, as if it was very smart. So, it's because, in a way, this is a, an example of something that we would call the revelation principle later. Um, so sometimes you can get the uh, polluter to kind of show him or herself as a polluter through a clever mechanism. So suppose when you buy the thermometer, I tell you, you look like you might be a polluter. I'm going to tax you now. And if you can prove you're not a polluter, I'll give you your money back. Now how do you prove you're not a polluter? Well, you hand the thing back. So that's a deposit refund. This is something we have on bottles and... But also, in Sweden the, there is this on a car. When you buy a car, there's something, I don't remember quite if it's like 5,000 kron or something, um, is a deposit. And if 25 years later, you hand in the car when it's to get it scrapped, you get that money back. If you don't, you leave it out in the woods, you lost your 5,000 krona. Um, and th so this is an incentive. We have a lot of woods in Sweden. Um, so we don't want all the cars to be left out there. We want them to be brought to the scrapyard. So that's why we have this deposit refund system. So it's not just Coca-Cola bottles. It can be used for lots of, and it's quite a clever mechanism. Anyway, <coughs> I'll also be talking about uh, another way of refunding charges for next Monday, I think, uh, refunded emission payments, which is sort of like a tax, but the money is given back. Yeah. This category here, the second column, is all about rights. Maybe we should have had that column first. I don't know. It's the most fundamental. Most fundamental instrument is the defining property rights. And one way to do that is through tradable permits. In fishing, we call them tradable quotas, fishing quotas. And we have, there are a lot of certificate schemes as well where you kind of have to have uh, uh, renewable energy certificates, for instance. You get them if you produce wind power, you, you, you get certificates. You produce these certificates, and then the power companies have to hold those, so they have to buy them from you. So this is a way of make, forcing the electricity companies to subsidize wind and solar. And this here is Common Property Resource Management, or for Common Pool Resources, same abbreviation. Yeah. So that's something where some of you were, were writing theses about, and uh, which Eleanor Ostrom made herself the, the grand pioneer of this subject. And we'll talk a bit more about that later. And we have all these regulation instruments. Yep. Well, common pool resources are just a kind of resource. Common property resource management is a policy. Yeah. So, common property resource management is when you have people, for instance, locally, managing a, um, a forest, or a lake, or coast, river, an irrigation scheme, 
And uh, Eleanor wrote uh, a number of books and articles on this, trying to find rules of what kind of schemes work and what kind of schemes don't work. By the way, I brought uh, books for those of you, so you could take that at the next break, those of you who haven't uh, gotten a copy of the book yet. So, do you know the difference between these two first categories here? People always say that <coughs> command and control or sort of physical regulation is some kind of stupid, uh, non-flexible mechanism. So performance standard, for instance, you have to be below three whatever grams per kilometer or, or something. If it's a car, for instance, uh, yeah. this is a, a, a rule. Your performance has to be better than this. And the technology standard is that you, you have to use a certain sort of whatever kind of technology. You have to have a catalyst is a good example. Yeah. So which instrument is better? What? Depends. It depends, thank you. That's usually the best answer, safest answer. <laughs> uh, so, well, we can turn around. What are some of the advantages of a of, um, performance standard? The performance standard, what advantages does it have over a technology standard? What? Flexibility. Yeah, flexibility. That's perfect. So this one has flexibility. That is in fact, funnily enough, that's sort of what, what is usually, when people don't know very much about this subject, they say, oh, economic instruments are like better for flexibility. And regulation is kind of not so good because it has no flexibility. Here we have two regulatory instruments. One of them is really very good for flexibility. It has exactly that property. It lets the producers, the engineers, the companies, or the individuals, lets them choose the technology, who are the experts. And so it's good for promoting technological development, creativity, uh, decentralized solutions, all these things. But what advantages does the technology standard have? Yes. Monitoring, for instance. I've been to a vehicle inspection uh, unit in outside Kathmandu in Nepal. And while well, they didn't have the resources to like, you know, to, to really analyze the exhausts. It was basically there was a policeman and he kind of had a stick and a torch. And so, yeah, he could check if there was a catalytic converter, but he couldn't do much more. So then, of course, that's an example. It shows you that there's a, if you have a requirement, you have to have a catalytic converter that's easier to monitor. I think that's the reason why the OECD also decided you have to have a big chimney if you had a, like a lot of you know, smoke. Thing. You could sort of fly over the Ruhr and you could check which industries had built the chimney and which hadn't. So you could kind of do some kind of inspection, monitoring. Simple. That's quite important. There might be some more advantages. Uh, let's think of a more like uh, promoting industry promotion. Um, this one, it creates a market. 
uh, and like the, the standardization gives you a guaranteed market and guaranteed scale and um, so the, the fact that some environmental protection agencies I think they started in basically in San Francisco uh, Funnily enough, the combination Volvo and San Francisco. Volvo was the car company that I think was first in actually succeeding in making them, uh, but San Francisco was the first jurisdiction really requiring them. So, um, uh, by requiring a catalytic converter, you were guaranteeing the car company's series of millions. So they could put serious money into one technology. He put serious money into one technology. That technology, of course, could take off much faster. So that's kind of an advantage. You get advantages of scale. Then uh, another advantage of, of kind of regulation of quantities is that you can um, you can be precise about when and where. So you can have, you can have prohibitions that, that apply to just the night, or just the summer, or just the dry months, or just, you know, uh, whatever, or just certain places. You could do that with prices too, but then it's um, typically a little bit more complicated. The last column there's kind of a uh, few things that are a little bit left over <coughs> that either use uh, information or other sort of legal um, mechanisms. I've been I've spent um, a lot of time the last couple of years in, in with the IPCC, and we've been writing a chapter on the design of policy instruments. So we're about 25 people locked up together, and we have to write 100 pages on policy instruments. And one of my, uh, it's quite a structure. The IPCC is a big monster, basically. So in this chapter, we have been three coordinating lead authors, and 20 lead authors, and then another 20 contributing authors, and then the review editors, and as a whole sort of hierarchy of people. One of the other coordinating lead authors a Japanese friend who um, his the only instrument he really likes is the voluntary agreement, um, which is is a sort of a misnomer as an instrument. If you really take it like um, very literally, then what is is it voluntary? I mean, if it's an agreement that is completely voluntary, then like, well, so what happened? I mean, then what, what is the instruments? Does that mean like, industry would have done this anyway? And of course, it's a little bit more complex than that because I think maybe you should imagine putting the words voluntary a little bit in citation marks. And when the EPA starts writing laws, for instance, about regulating a certain quantity or, or a tax, it becomes like a threat. If at that moment, when, like, when the ink is not red, quite dry yet uh, on the proposed laws, the industry sits down and says, oh, we have a voluntary agreement here, we will stop polluting, uh, you don't need to write the law. Then it's not really completely voluntary. I mean, it's like voluntary, but with the, against the background of a threat of legislation. Now, that's probably, you know, that captures some of the reality here. And we'll talk more about this. But it's it's a very clever idea. If industry, if they see that they're going to be regulated, it's clever of them to try to preempt the regulation and say, oh, we, this is something we want to do anyway so you don't need to regulate us. And the success of this instrument depends very much on the structure of the industry. If you have a powerful 
oligopolies like they do in Japan, where there's a small group of industries that run the whole of Japanese industry. You know. Then they have a stronger incentive to organize themselves well and to do this than uh, in more perfect competition. Liability, finally, um, is, um, is an important instrument. And there's different kinds of liability. So there's three Latin words that um, that are kind of interesting here. What do we mean by you caused my death? Well, suppose I'm standing by a door, picking my tooth with a very sharp knife, and then someone sort of um, opens the door, and the uh, knife goes through, and I die. Yeah. Well, they caused my death um, in some simple manner. Of, yeah, if they hadn't opened the door, I wouldn't have died. But they couldn't know this. So, would they be liable in a court? No. Um, yeah, maybe they should look before they open the door. You know, particularly if there's a window, you can kind of look in before you charge in. So maybe they had some responsibility to be careful. You know, but <coughs> this is when you cause something. Um, This is when you are at fault, when it's your fault. And dolus is when you have an intent to kill. I see that uh, there's a sort of progression here. And, um, and you find this in legal systems. You could be, you could be condemned to, I, there is something called manslaughter, for instance. That's when you cause someone's death, but it's not not murder, because murder requires intent that you actually wanted to kill them. Manslaughter might be that you kill them by negligence. Now, the negligence can also be punishable if you're, like, really being reckless, like driving too fast. It's not the same thing as murder, because you're not a specific person that you're trying to kill, but you are putting people at risk in general. So in the same way with the environment, we have, or you can be more or less, and, and there are different kinds of rules of liability. And there is strict liability, and there is negligence liability, for instance, it are two legal concepts, negligence and strict liability. And this is that you are always liable. So you make a product and it ends up killing people and you are always liable. In the United States there are lots of cases where, for instance, um, products are considered dangerous and then people, uh, the companies get sued, like the tobacco companies. It's quite a difference. In, in Europe, we tend more to regulate things. We think, oh, that might be dangerous, let's regulate it. In the US, it's more like, oh, well, that's your problem. Uh, but then if it turns out that a lot of people die, they can sue, and then you, you might be, you know, have to pay many millions of dollars. I had a friend who was a neighbor who was an environmental lawyer, and he had lots of strange cases. Once he was, um, there was a case about a gun manufacturer, they were being sued because their products could be dangerous. You think it's kind of obvious with a gun. You think that you could almost sue them if their product was not dangerous, that's kind of why you buy a gun, but... Um, <coughs> 
so societies can have very different structures how much weight you put into liability and maybe there's a trade-off where some societies will regulate more a state is more paternalistic uh, when you regulate you kind of remove some of the liability from the producers and the producers say, well I was just doing what I was told and you know the EPA the Swedish EPA said it was okay and surely it must be you know okay so you can't come and sue me afterwards so there's a bit of a trade-off between that kind of liability instrument and 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 there is quite a debate you'll find articles about which is best you might think that the strict liability is best but then you know um, it's quite complicated uh, sometimes companies in the US they will um, they will not do research on their own products because they do not want anywhere in the company any papers lying around which might later be used against the company to show that they knew that the product could be dangerous. So then you actually have a, a policy uh, that makes you not find out <laughs> because, because any proof that you might have known could be used against you. Well, that's not very good. You don't really want a, a legal system that makes companies not find out about their own products. And you've kind of gone too far in one direction. 